just looked at that verse Beautiful. this morning in Sunday school, Psalm 33, 12. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. And uh, as long as we are walking with him, we are blessed. Amen. Well, what does that tell us about our nation right now? <laughs> We're having trouble walking with him, aren't we? Yeah. And I hope you're not as a Christian, but our nation as a whole are. So we need to change that, do our part. Let's all, let's all stand. That was the first sermon this morning. Now we'll have the second one later. Let's all stand and start out our, our service by singing 679, The Battle Hymn of the Republic. today. Lord, we know that you said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. We know that you dwelled in the heart of every believer in our bodies, Lord, as your temple. But Father, we want you to be with us and we want to feel your <coughs> presence in this place as we worship you today because you said where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. Lord, if, if we could have you here in that way, and we have promised that, Lord, we know that uh, Satan would not attempt and would not be able to stand to be in this place. Lord, we pray that you would just give us uh, a heart and an attitude of worship, to truly worship you, to magnify you, and Lord, to bring honor and glory to your name. We pray that your will would be done in this place. We pray that your will would be done in our hearts, that we would listen to the word and, and that we would take inventory of our hearts. Please bless this service. We thank you for loving us. We thank you for America. She has a lot of problems, Lord. She's in a lot of trouble. We know the only hope for America is you. We pray, Father, for revival in our country. Bless now, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. So glad you're here today. And I want to read a nice note that came from um, Melody Ellis is the dear lady that spoke to you ladies at the mother-daughter tea, if you didn't know her name. Dear Dorothy and people of Camp Lake Baptist Church, thank you for the opportunity to speak at your banquet. It was truly a blessing to me. May God bless your ministry there sincerely. 
Melody Ellis. Now, she is a pastor's wife from over in the middle of the state, and that was very nice that she came and spoke. That was wonderful. Well, I hope that uh, you'll think about something tonight. You might say, well, this is a holiday weekend. Pastor, how do you expect us to come back to church? Why well, just get out there in your little car and start it up and come? It's not hard. But you won't want to miss it. We're having Maranatha come over. Our friends from about four miles away, five miles away, they're going to come. We love having them. We're going to have food. Now that right there ought to make you come. We're going to have a hymn sing, okay? We're having a hymn sing, and then we're going to have a wonderful time of fellowship. And just to remind you from the bulletin, and I'll say the rest of the uh, messages to later, hymn sing with Maranatha. The fellowship meal will be a potluck. So please bring enough food, as it says on there. Read that note and make sure you bring enough food, please. I hope you'll come back tonight. It'll be a wonderful time. It's a joy to be able to feed these other people. They do a good job when we go over there. We don't want to let them down. Amen? So I hope we have a great time tonight. And I hope you will come back. That's fine. Okay, great. <clears throat> Open to the page number. I did, but I turned it. I mean, was, uh, <coughs> up there at 681. It was just one page over from where we were before. Oh, beautiful for spacious skies. Christ. Well, I want to do something special this morning. We think we can do it, uh, Sam? All right, we're going to um, play something for you. And because I need to have the lights off for this, I want you to enjoy it. And then after that, we want to recognize 
our veterans, okay? So why don't you uh, go ahead and start, Sam? Would you stand, please? Can I stand on behalf of my husband? You sure can. You sure can. Thank you for that. In the Army? Oh, thank you for that, Miriam. And tell, tell Floyd how much we appreciate him. Amen. Yes, sir. Howie. United States Air Force. Thank you for your service. Thank you very much. Dave? United States Air Force. Amen. I see 
making your standing for your husband? In the army. In the army. Yeah. Is that what? Amen. Who are you pointing to? Dave, Steve. Steve. United States Air Force as well. Am I right? Wow. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Thanks all, thank you all for your service to our country. We appreciate you very much. We have a display on the back. If you haven't looked at that lately, take a look at the various uh, people that have been a part of our church that have served. And I think of... Um, I think of um, Dick Traxler and his boys. If you go over to their house, you see that uh, display out in front. Amen. I'm just thankful, very thankful for all of you who have uh, served and for you uh, ladies whose husbands have served. Thank you so much. And ladies have served as well. We appreciate it very, very much. And we're humbled. We're truly humbled. Uh, we what we have in this country we just can't take this for granted amen, amen. Uh, just want to say um, be reading your bulletin uh, the main thing that, that I want to emphasize is um, uh, <clears throat> next week brother Bill Jenkins the third a, a friend of mine and uh, who has been longtime president of the uh, Continental Baptist missions that is wrapping up Sorry, I got emotional there. And um, he's actually ending that soon. And he's in the area this next week, taking care of some of those things. But I was so glad to hear that he was available to preach next Sunday morning here at our church. And I'm looking forward to that. And Brother Bill and his wife, Terry, will be here. And then in the evening service, Daniel and Asia Long will be with us, our missionaries. So it's gonna be exciting to have these visitors they're not so much visitors as they are friends, and uh, uh, we're so excited about that. Now, I will say this, that Brother Joe Marshall, whom I haven't met in person, I've talked to him on the phone, he has a ministry called the AV Sign Ministry. He's going to be at, at Brother um, Van Belsen's church on the other side of Sparta that morning on the 26th, and he'll be here in the evening service on June 26th. Looking forward to that. Be sure to read all of the, the, the all the bulletin announcements. But I just want to say this: VBS is quickly approaching. As we think about uh, how that is, just two months away. It's the first week of August. Here we are, right at the first week of of uh, June. So it's coming, and there's a lot of announcements about VBS. There's a park party on on June 22nd. Uh, there is a community event on the 16th of July, there's a workers' meeting on the 17th. Uh, 28th to 29th of July is decorating. And then the 31st, which is the last Sunday of July, we have a VBS opening program. And uh, then the next day is the beginning of VBS. So it's going to be exciting. So keep praying for that. Men, if you'll come, we'll take our offering. When uh, Isaac's ordination happens, I'll be gone that Sunday. Uh, Brother Chad Kuinga will be preaching in my absence. I appreciate his willingness, and uh, uh, that's. Uh, I hope you will be here and support him and encourage him. So that's coming up on August the 14th. Father, I thank you so much, Lord, that I'm an American. Mm -hmm. Lord, uh, none of us could choose our birth, our place of birth, our parents, uh, but by your grace, we have been allowed to be born in the greatest country on earth right now. Lord, we just pray for revival in our nation. We thank you for the brave men and women who have put their lives on the line, and many of them have given all. They've given the ultimate sacrifice for our freedoms. We thank you, Lord. We're sad for them and for their relatives, but we think about, uh, are we truly appreciative? Do we, do we pray for America? Do we hold up America in our thoughts and in our prayers regularly, Lord. We pray that we will continue to do so. We pray for revival in our nation. I pray, Father, you bless this offering in each giver. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>
that was, or the Statue of Liberty, or the cross is our Statue of Liberty. I forget the exact name of the song, but yeah, what a wonderful song. And very well played. Thank you very much, April, for that. I just want to emphasize this Saturday because it is the big teen event where we've been publishing. Uh, the Ultimate Adventure, they call it, down at Fellowship Baptist Church. Uh, King Conference this Saturday. And your teenagers need to be here ready to leave at 7.30 in the morning. All right, 7.30 in the morning. And I still want to encourage you, invite your friends. Find somebody to bring. Uh, I, want, I want to load up both bands. I want to bring both bands down there. Amen. You know, I'll drive one, Ben will drive the other, and you know, we'll haul you down there. All right, they can have all kinds of things planned. I have never been to this. Actually, it's a new conference. Uh, they're just putting it on. But uh, the youth pastor there, his name is Pastor Ben White. And uh, he's been texting me um, weekly. You know, just, he's so excited about what's going on. He texted me again yesterday. He said, I can't believe it's only seven days away. So was, he says, can bring your teens down. We're going to have such a great time. Uh, indoor games, outdoor games, prizes, a special speaker, giving the gospel. He wants you to bring your unsafe friends, okay? So... I want to encourage you to do that. But the main thing I want the adults to hear is 7.30 in the morning. They need to be here, okay? 7.30 in the morning. There's no cost at all. And this church is supplying uh, everything. So they're not charging anything for all they're doing for them. All right, so that's this Saturday. Then also Fort Faith has a big day too, Spring yes. Fest. If you can't get to our thing, get Maybe. up there. I mean, they have a lot of churches involved in that. And um, and uh, I'm sure they could use uh, the help, the attendance. Uh, it's, it's a big event over at Fort Faith. The Spring Amen. Fest. So they got all kinds of speakers going and activities going. So lots of opportunities this next weekend to, to be involved in something. So don't just sit home and, and uh, watch reruns of something. Uh, get involved. Go do something. All right? Do something for the Lord. All right. So this weekend, lots of opportunities. All right. Our hymn of greeting is, is going to be number 680, My Country Tis of Me. But before we sing it, let's stand this morning and greet one another at Camp Lake Baptist Church. <laughs>
Amen. Thank you. that. Thank you, Esther. Thank you, Paul. That was a blessing. All the music today. Tremendous. Thank you for the song choices, April, and your offertory. All of that was a blessing. Take your Bibles this morning and turn to Hebrews 10. Hebrews 10. Now, tonight in the um, hymn sing, I'm just going to share a, a devotional tonight from my heart, more along the line of... Um, appreciation for those who have made the ultimate sacrifice. I have some passages I want to read, but I won't be long in that regard. But I wanted to continue our series in Hebrews today. And um, chapter 10, uh, wow, there's so much here. And let's see, I'm getting a pretty good start. 11.05, hmm, when will I finish? Doesn't really matter. Let's just, let's just focus on the word and, and we won't worry about the clock. But anyway, you know the old saying, you know what it means when a pastor looks at the clock? 
Absolutely nothing. <laughs> but it does. I don't like to go past at noon, but I will just ask you to pray for me that I will uh, preach through the power of the Holy Spirit. And the Word of God is there for us. That's what we need to keep focusing on. Amen? Yeah. Father, I pray that you would be honored and glorified, and I pray, Lord, that uh, we would hold your Word in high esteem, and that we would hold these things to be the truth. And Lord, that if, if we would be not hypocritical, uh, we would realize that these are the things we need to follow. These are the things that we need to make more important than anything else. And I pray, Father, if there's anyone here that's not saved, may they get saved today. We know we have no promise of tomorrow. But we have today. We ask that you would just bless the word now in a mighty way. In Jesus' name, amen. I was thinking about, this is kind of probably the last time I say this in relation to the study, because when we get to chapter 11, it's the Hall of Faith, and uh, we get to chapter 12, there's some wonderful passages there about, you know, consider him that endured such contradiction. I'm probably not going to mention this fact, that this theme of Hebrews is the superiority of Christ. Have you heard me say that before? The superiority of Christ. And, and I just want to mention it again because what good is it to know that that's the theme of the, God, of the book of Hebrews? What good is it to know that's true but not make it true in your own life? Is Christ superior in our own lives to all the other things that want our attention? That's the question. And I hope that if you would think back to any of the other messages... And you hear me talking about here, it, he's trying, the writer is trying to convince these Jews that are on the fence that Jesus is superior to the law, to Moses, to angels, uh, to everything that was before him and everything that's after him. And we see that to be so, but how do we apply that to us as believers today? Is he superior? Does he have priority? Is he number one in our lives? I would say that every one of us needs to do inventory. Every one of us needs to rethink about that verse we talked about recently, Anne, from Romans 12, where it says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And yet, many Christians, that's, that's, they're not even in the radar of that. And I think the main reason is one word. It's called sin. The sin of covetousness, which is idolatry. Uh, things, wanting things, wanting more. And the mind and the worship. You would say, I won't worship things. But if they occupy our whole being, are we not worshiping them? It could be selfishness. It could be lust. It could be all kinds of sin could come into place of God in our lives and in the place of Jesus. He's still your Savior. You can't lose your salvation if you're saved. But he could be taking a back burner position. Does that mean he's superior to you? No. I just, I, I just want to put that forth before we get into the passage today. We've been talking a lot about the superiority of Christ. The real issue, is he superior in my life? Is he superior in yours? Does he have the first place? Well, I've already prayed. Let's begin reading. I'd like to read the four, first four verses and then talk about that a little bit. For the law, having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things, can never, with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually, make the comers thereunto perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered? Because that the worshipers, once purged, should have had no more conscience of sins. But in those sacrifices there is a remembrance, again, made of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sin. My first point this morning is the law's inability. Now the law is not faulty in the sense that it is flawed, Okay, the Bible says the law is our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. How is it that it does that? Um, it shows us our faults, does it not? 
You remember your schoolmasters at school? Do you remember any teacher? I remember a Mrs. Davis. All I remember about her, I don't remember her voice. I can barely remember her face, but I remember she paddled me one time. <laughs> she paddled me. I think it was a ping pong paddle, but I didn't do something right. And next thing I know, my little two, uh, seven-year-old body, second grader, I was being paddled. And I didn't appreciate it, but I straightened up, okay? In a, in a real sense, the law as a schoolmaster shows us that we are sinners. We can't keep the law, doesn't it? So I'm not saying the law is faulty, but there is an inability of the law. Two words I want you to, uh, two, a word and a phrase I want you to look at. In verse one, the word is never. <laughs> never. That's a dangerous word that you should not tout out there. When Mary was uh, going away to college, she had already been to college for a year uh, at ba Grisbu, Grand Rapids School of Bible and Music. And then she felt the Lord was leading her to Tennessee Temple. And she told her mom, she was one thing you can know for sure. I will never marry a Southerner. She didn't like how we talk. Mm -hmm. I will never marry a Southerner and I will never marry a preacher. Because they always run off with the, with the pianist. And, and, you know, that was her thinking. I will never do those two things. Well, she married a Southerner. She married a preacher. Be careful about your boasting. Amen. But here is a very stern statement in the Bible that uses the word never. It says it can never can never, with those sacrifices, uh, make the comers there into perfect. Then you go to verse 4. It says the phrase, not possible. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sin. So I just wanted you to think about the law's inability to take you to the point. It is a schoolmaster to bring you to Christ. But you need something else. And that's what we're going to look at in verses five through eight. And I'll tell you what I think about that in a minute. Let's read it. There, there, wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, lo, I come, notice the parentheses, in the volume of the book it is written of me, to do thy will, O God, Above, when he said, sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings uh, and offering for sin, thou wouldest not, neither hadst pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. I think I said five through eight. I meant 18. We're going to keep read all the way down to 18. Bear with me. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. I wish I would have seen that phrase ahead of last week's message title was once for all. And there it is again. But that doesn't matter. I want you to see that the message today is a new and living way. Be looking for that phrase when we get to it in a little bit. But he says, and every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, after that he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God, from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified, whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us. For after that he had said, before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them, and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. I thought of this phrase, this is my second point, the Lord's finality. What does that mean? He didn't have to go back. We saw it in the previous chapter once. He was offered once. And if you go back further, when it talks about um, if somebody <clears throat> fails, falling away, the, that, uh, they crucify the Lord afresh, that is an affront to Christ because he made a final offering one time of himself. And it's a very interesting process. Let's go back and look at something. Look at Psalm verse, uh, chapter 40 of Psalms. Excuse me, the 40th Psalm. Um, these verses 
I'm specifically speaking of Tarsus. Verse 5, we're going to look at how 40, verses 6 through 8, is a prophetic passage talking about Christ. Okay? Delighting to do the will of God. <clears throat> Listen to these verses out of Psalm 40, verse 6. Sacrifice and offering thou didst not desire. Mine ears have thou opened. Burnt offering and sin offering hast thou not required. Then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book it is written of me. I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. Interesting, in light of the later verses that says, I will put my laws in their hearts and I will, in their minds will I write them. But Jesus had them in himself already. And this was prophetic of him. Uh, as much as David knew and as much as David could recite the law that he knew, it, this is not talking about him. It is evident from the Holy Spirit now we see in the book of Hebrews that this was talking about Christ. I wonder when he said that. I wonder if he said it many times. I know in the Garden of Gethsemane, when he was under that great press, remember Gethsemane means a, a, a press, a heavy press. It is an olive press. And under that intense pressure where he sweat, as it were, great drops of blood, Jesus said, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass for me. That cup is that cup of fury, that cup of God's wrath that will be poured out on all the wicked someday. But Jesus took that cup as he hung on the cross of God's wrath. And that's why he prayed, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He said, if it be possible, let this cup pass. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. I wonder if that's when he said this or sometime in his childhood as he was very much about the law. Remember when he was 12 and they had to go back and look for him in Jerusalem and he was confounding the doctors because he knew so much. How, at some point in time, he knew that this was about him. I come in the volume of the book it is written of me. I come to do thy will, O God. What an amazing passage of scripture. And here the writer, the writer through the Holy Spirit shares that that passage is talking about Jesus. The Lord's finality. He got it done and he sat down. Remember, there are no chairs in the holy of holies of the tabernacle or the temple they didn't sit somebody asked me recently did they have did they have a, a bells on the garments of yeah they had bells and pomegranates that went around the hem of the garden the garment they could hear them walking in there and i don't know of any particular case where they had to drag anybody out but had that bell stopped ringing somebody would have known they violated god in some way and they were dead inside i never heard about that in scripture i had a, uh, a professor who said that they had a rope tied about them so they could drag them out. I don't know that that's accurate. I couldn't find that in the Bible. But I did know that it says bells and pomegranates on there. So they had to go in there. They couldn't sit down. There was no place to rest. It was once a year. Jesus, it's once for all. Isn't that great? The superiority in that the Lord's final, the finality. The law, inability. The Lord, finality. He sat down. Christ will never have to do that again. Isn't that great? No more offering for sin. Very important. And then I want you to see uh, that the title is A New and Living Way. The Living Way, as we read verses 19 through 25. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Wait a minute. He's talking to us. Are we priests? Did you know that we are? Did you know that there is a biblical doctrine called the priesthood of the believer? There is one mediator between God and men. Paul wrote this under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. The man, Christ Jesus. One mediator is Jesus. It's Jesus is the direct. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. He's the only mediator to God. But every Christian has a priesthood. Look at verse Number 19 there again, it says, Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. That priest, that high priest, could not go in without blood. He went in with blood, and remember, that blood could not take away sin. But I'm just telling you, he went in with blood, and, for the, and he, he um, 
offered for the sins of himself and for the sins of the people once a year. Now we have, because of the body of Christ and because of the fact that Jesus has taken that veil away, and, and you saw that back there when it talks about he taketh away the first that he may establish the second. Now we have a new and living way. And that's what it says in verse 20, by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. But yet, that Lamb hasn't just been slain and left. It didn't just get departed and burned up on the altar. The Lamb of God was buried and he rose again. A new and living way. But you and I have the opportunity, verse 19, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest. Well, I need to look at another passage to kind of help you there. Um, 416, go back in your book of Hebrews. You know it well, but it, it behooves us to read it because it's such a wonderful passage. And it's talking about the fact that we have this high priest, Jesus, who is touched by the feeling of our infirmities as opposed to those in the Old Testament who could not. It says, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. <clears throat> we can come boldly. Now, I just imagine uh, the throne of, what was his name? Ahasuerus, the one who... After Vashti said, no, I'm not going to come. She was banished from being the queen, and he had a search for a new queen. And Esther was one of those that were chosen to try out to be the new queen, and she became the queen. And when it was found out through Mordecai that there was a, a plot to destroy the Jews, and uh, remember that phrase, for such a time as this. And she asked the people to pray that knew about it. They, she said, pray and fast in three days. And then she went and she came boldly to that throne and to that king. And if he would have not have dipped that scepter to her, she could have been killed. She, she said, if I die, I die. I, I'm, I'm called by God to do this for such a time. And it was first the chiding of, of her uncle Mordecai who said, if you don't do it, God will enlarge Israel and God will come from some other place and help. He doesn't use the term God because God isn't mentioned in the book of uh, Esther. But we know that he's beside the, behind the scenes working. And he, she said, if I die, I die. So she went boldly to that king. And it, you know the rest of the story. You and I, we have a loving heavenly father we have a wonderful Savior who loves us, and we can come boldly to the throne of grace. Amen. Notice it's called a throne of grace there in 4.16. And so here we have it in 19, having therefore, brethren, boldness. Now, there's a difference between boldness and brashness. Brashness is when people are self-assured and a smarty pants type attitude when they do something or say something. You know, that's brash. Bold in a Christian sense, is based on faith. Bold is acting on faith on what God has told us right here. We can be bold as a lion. I remember uh, the kids, Mary was teaching them a song. I don't remember all the words, but it, they would sing that part. Bold as a lion. I'm here, Thomas. Roar! Roaring. <laughs> I can still hear them kids singing that song. And they would roar. But bold as a lion. We as Christians need to be bold in our witness we need to be bold in our convictions, and we need to be bold when it comes to coming to Jesus because he went all the way for us and died on the cross for us and intercedes for us now. And why should we be so wimpy when it comes to prayer and when it comes to the things we need? Oh, I don't, I don't know. I don't know if the Lord will like it if I come and talk to him. We need to be bold, not because we are anything but because he is true to his word. Mm -hmm. So he says, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. I'm saved by the blood of Christ. Amen. Think about that. Well, you're, a teen, you're a bloody preacher, bloody religion, bloody this and bloody that. I'm saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. No apologies. Amen. 
Never apologize for that. We are saved by the precious blood of Christ. He poured his blood out for our sins and for our salvation. Amen. Accept the free gift of God. Be bold. Come into that. Do we not all have a time of need? Are we not all in need of the grace of God? Are we not all in need of his help from time to time? Daily, but sometimes more than others. I think, how can somebody go through what these people down there in Texas went through this week? Only by God's grace. Only by God's grace. Here's four little kids whose mom got shot, and then their dad died of a heart attack. Did you know that? That was terrible. All of the parents, all the grandparents, all the siblings of these little children that got killed. And you might say, how can God, and don't start blaming God, okay? Be careful. How can God allow something like that to happen? God makes a way for every person because everyone has an appointment. Those little kids, I'm not, I am not in any way saying anything was okay about what happened. That wicked man that shot them up, that's terrible. But from God's perspective, that was their appointment. That was their appointment. From God's perspective, it is appointed unto man once to die. And what we all have to know is everybody needs to be ready for their appointment. We saw that in chapter 9. But here, brethren, talking to the saved here, brethren, we have a new and living way. We have this, it's different than that old veil that was so old. And I'm sure it was the same one that Moses had made that got passed down. And as the temple took over and they probably took that same veil. Maybe they had to make a different one out of the tabernacle, wherever it was kept, and put it up there in Jerusalem. And it was destroyed twice. Well, it's destroyed once, destroyed the last time after Christ. But I'm thinking about, there's that veil that was rent from top to bottom when Jesus was hanging on the cross. A new and living way. The veil or the the only thing that keeps us from going into the presence of the Father is the body, the blood of Jesus Christ. And so we now have access through him. So enter. Boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Christ. Isn't that great? Sometimes out of the blue, things happen to us. An unexpected accident. Unexpected loss. Unexpected new diagnosis from your doctor. Unexpected. We know things happen all the time. We don't expect them. We know something bad's going to happen. We know we're going to get sick. We know we're all going to die if the Lord tarries. But in the process, we're like, oh no, what do I do now? Why don't you come boldly into the throne of grace? Because the Bible says to do so right here. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. I like that. That's a great phrase. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. You see, the reason you can do what verse 19 says is because you have faith. If you're saved, you have faith. Faith that you really have to lay at Jesus' feet. We're going to find in chapter 12 that he is the author and the finisher of our faith. We're going to find out that if you have faith, you got it from his word. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. So he says, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith. You know, James puts it this way. Nothing wavering. Nothing wavering. You know, some people are like, you know, Peter, he wavered. He was out there... There wasn't just one man that walked on water. Look at the story. Peter walked on water too. But he took his eyes off the Lord and he started sinking. You see, we don't want to waver. We want to go in full assurance in the understanding of our faith that God is true to his word. You can trust him. But what if he says no? You'll be able to handle it. What if he, the answer is not what I think it should be? you'll find out that God's way is the best way. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. Do you love God? Yes. Trust him. 
So he says, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil. That is to say his flesh. I wanted to make sure I read that. That veil, that's his flesh. When the other one ripped, Jesus had given his flesh. He had given his body to be broken for us. Then poured out his blood. So let us draw near with a true heart. I like that. Read on. Having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Now, the work of the Holy Spirit is this, through the word. Because there are other passages that talk about this. Um, you know, they had, a, they had a laver in front of the temple where they washed their hands before they went in. And you might think, well, they were really, really peculiar about this watching. In fact, they even accused the Lord back in the day. that Why don't you wash your hands? Why don't you, uh, you, you guys don't wash it. The Lord talked about the, that which goes in the mouth is not what defiles a man. It's what comes out of the heart and so forth. But when we talk about uh, a conscience here, when he does, an evil conscience, we all have an evil conscience. We all have a heart that is deceitful above all things. Read it. Jeremiah 17, 9. All of us do. Don't think you're accepted. Don't think, well, I'm special. I'm, I'm the Lord God's special pet. Uh, you remember being having a teacher's pet in your class, how they were despised because the teacher showed preference to them? God shows no preference. With God, there is no respect of persons. And so none of us can say, well, I don't have these problems that everybody else. We all do, folks. And we need to be sprinkled from that evil conscience. And we need to have our bodies washed in a spiritual sense. And he says so, now ye are clean through the word which I've spoken unto you. John 15, 3. Another passage, I think it's in Ephesians, it says, the washing of water by the word. Isn't that great? Did you take a shower today? I hope so. You're taking care of your physical body. But you know what? You need the washing of the water of the word even more. Yeah. You need to have that evil conscience sprinkled because of the blood of Christ. And that's where you can take 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Did you wash behind your ears? How many have ever heard that before? <laughs> it's a total cleansing. He will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Isn't that great? Great promise, 1 John 1. Where was I? Verse 23. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. Oh, there it is. I thought it was uh, James that said that. No, it was, it was the writer here. I'll tell you in my opinion who he is in a minute. For he is faithful, that promise, without wavering. James does mention that, but he mentions it right here. Let's hold on. Hold your profession. Don't be a wishy-washy person. This, you have a living way. And that living way is Jesus Christ who is alive, interceding for you at the right hand of the Father, deflecting every accusation of the old devil who's the accuser of the brethren. He is your advocate in glory, the propitiation of our sins. Let's see, that's going to go through uh, 25. How far did I read? Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. You know, when you're saved, it's not all about you. You don't live, you're not, no man is an island. No Christian is all about getting everything they can soak up at church for themselves. Why not let yourself get stepped on a little bit and give out? Give out a little love and give it a little encouragement. How about the word edification? Edification involves building each other up. Uh, looking for their good to edification, doing good unto all men, especially unto they who are of the household of faith. We need to be doing good to all men. But we also, when we know somebody's a believer, uh, we need to treat them special and especially right. So he says, hold fast our profession and let us consider one another to prove unto love and to good works. Then he says in 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. It's more important than ever. The terrible, wicked world we're in, we see the violence, we see the hatred, we see the confusion, we see the wrong thinking that's being pounded into the heads of little children and confusing them, and all this garbage that's being taught. 
and we have the word of God right here. We should be standing firm on the word. Let us not forsaking this assembly. When, when COVID happened, some people just disappeared. I'm not going to key on them. I'm just saying, it's interesting. It seems like that's how much more we need to be together in light of the Lord's coming. Mm -hmm. That COVID was a convenient excuse for some to say, we're just going to have church at home. No. We're not to forsake the assembly of ourselves together. And the reality is, folks, I remember our governor saying, the most dangerous place you can be is in a church. No way. No. The most dangerous, this is not her exact word, but here it said, the da most dangerous thing you can do is go to church. No, the most dangerous thing you can do is put off accepting Christ and end up in hell. That's the most dangerous thing you can do. And I preached on that immediately after she said that. I said those same things. The most dangerous thing is not be in a room with other people. We have come to find out that a lot of this was hyped and it was this. and it, We actually all needed to get it one way or another for us to have uh, community immunity, I guess you could say. Really, that happened whether they wanted to or not. And most every one of us has had this thing. And I will say, I do not blame anyone for coming to church. We are not super spreaders because we came to church. The Bible is still in existence. It's still in force. We're not to forsake the assembly of ourselves together. Yeah, we put off church for six weeks in 2020 out of abundance of caution. And then I saw how political it was. We came back to church. Praise God. We put it off in the next year because Pastor Mark and Kim and me and Mary all got COVID at the same time. We went up to a conference that year, that month. And so we put it off for three weeks. We didn't have church for three weeks just because out of the abundance of caution that we came back together. But in the general, they might say, oh, you shouldn't be having church. You're super spreaders. You're the problem, people. We have the Bible saying not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together. Amen. And I'm thankful that we're meeting. We've taken a hit. Every church has, I would say, in some way or another because of COVID. Satan is crafty. He's going to try one thing after another. Mm -hmm. But we're back. Praise God. Amen. Amen. In 2020, in the midst of COVID, we had $100,000 came in to our building project fund. Mm -hmm. um, remarkable. In 2021, we had $110,000 come in to our building project fund. Even more remarkable. And at the same time, the speedometer went all the way up to 60000 that was a good idea Dora had. Instead of a thermometer, why don't we use a speedometer? That's a great idea. Matching fun. I'm just saying, isn't God good? Isn't God able to do something even in the midst when everybody's saying, oh, no, oh, we can't do it. We can't do it. We can't do it. We've got to look at this full assurance of faith that was mentioned here. We've got to look at this word boldness. Amen. We've got to realize that we have a new and a living way Amen. through Jesus Christ. I like it that we focus on being alive and the life. This morning we finished up. We didn't really get spend a lot of time on it, but the last part of Luke 20 where those Sadducees had come and they were moaning and groaning about the resurrection and trying to prove Jesus wrong. And they were wrong, of course, but he said, have you not read where Moses at the burning bush, God says, he was the God of Abraham, and Isaac, and Jacob. He's not the God of the dead. He's the God of the living. Wow. And he is alive. And he represents us in glory. And he's waiting for us to come to that place he's prepared for us. Well, before we get too far, and that's through 25, let's start reading in verse 26. Fourth, I want to talk about the Lord's vengeance. We've talked about the law's inability, the Lord's finality, the living way. Number four, the Lord's vengeance and judgment. It says, For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sin. Now, I think some people have wrongly tried to apply this to every sin that a Christian's ever committed. You know, how many times have we sinned willfully in our lives? All of us have. This is talking about the person who has heard the truth who will not accept Jesus as their Savior. Remember, the whole theme of Hebrews is to convince these people, it's a mixed crowd, the ones that are believers, 
Because when he says brethren, he knows he's talking to them. But to the ones who haven't received Christ yet, or who are on the fence, who haven't made that decision, there's a warning. If we sin willfully after we receive the knowledge of the truth, there is a phrase in Romans that says, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Yeah, isn't that a sad state? Um, we see that in, <clears throat> I was, I was in, up in the middle of the night, and uh, I can't help it, I'm up a lot of times, but uh, I was reading a message by a, um, a, a Professor Dutton, who was a professor at Princeton <laughs> in 1901. And he was writing about the fact that the, the apostles were premillennials. And this is a professor at Princeton talking about the things of God and talking about the things of the scriptures. And, and that's what Princeton originally was, a place to prepare men for the ministry. If you were to go to, there today and start talking about that, they would kick you out of there so fast, wouldn't they? Ever learning but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Here is, if we sin willfully after that we've received the knowledge of the truth, and I think he's saying we as the Jews that he's writing to and he cares about so much. If you Jews who are like us, who've had the oracles, who've had the law, who've had all of these blessings, and yet you rejected Jesus, and if you continue to do that and you reject him, there's no more sacrifice for sin. There's no other lambs that should be offered. There's no bullocks. There's no more. Remember the finality of the Lord? But a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. I think the context of this whole section right here, 26 through 31, is those who reject Christ. All they have to look for, all they have to look for is the fiery indignation of God and the fires of hell, the lake of fire. How sad. Mm -hmm. Dr. J. Vernon McKee, I was listening to his message recently, and he was talking about, he had, he says, I've done lots of funerals, and I have too. He said, I did a funeral for a, a lady, and I knew her husband. He was a, he was a uh, cussed, uh, uh, drunkard, and when I tried to witness to him, he, he cursed me out of the house, and he said, I don't believe in any of that garbage. And she, He was doing that man's funeral, and this woman came to him, the wife, the widow, and she said, is there any hope? And he says, all I can say is there's hope for you. I don't know, I didn't hear the rest of it, whether she got saved or not, but what he's trying to say is there's no hope. Without Christ, there's no hope. Did you read that in 1 Thessalonians 4.13? <clears throat> Where the Lord, Paul, writing to the people there, he says that you sorrow not as others who have no hope. There are people in this world that have no hope because they have no faith, because they have not Christ. And so he says, a fearful looking for of judgment. Verse 28 says, he that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. If somebody, that's not for me, I don't have to listen to that. They might have gotten stoned. They might have gotten stoned. They might have gotten uh, in some way killed, pierced through. If somebody came up and touched that mount when God had warned him to save them, don't do it. They were to be pierced through with a spear. He said they died without, two, without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sore, listen to this 29, it's so important. Of how much sorer punishment suppose he shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God. How does anybody trodden underfoot the Son of God? Well, have you been out there in the marketplace lately? Have you listened to how that they want to intermingle the name of God with their filthy language? Have you heard it on TV and in movies and in the marketplace and on the job site? I remember it would make me cringe. 
to hear the, the lovely name of Jesus. That's a name that's better than any name. But then they add their wickedness to it. They don't know Jesus, but they choose to take his name in vain and sully his name and drag him through the mud. And is that not putting him as trodden under the foot? The Son of God. And hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing? And hath done despite unto the spirit of grace. These people, are, they shake their fists at God. They sing their songs. Imagine there's no heaven. There's no hell. They just want to say, they put on their car, I'm an atheist. I saw a bumper sticker. Uh, it says, God is a woman and boy is she. And I can't repeat all that that was said. God is not a woman. That's garbage from the pits of hell. These are the people that he's talking about. And the people of his day who would not receive Christ, who would not take that step, they considered it, they perceived it was something they needed to think about. After receiving the knowledge of the truth. You see, it's a dangerous thing to receive the knowledge of the truth. What are you going to do with it? I won't be there until next Sunday night. Nope, two weeks now because Brother Long. On the Sunday night of the 12th, I'll be in 2 Thessalonians 2. You read that sometime where God sends strong delusion to who? Anyone who would not receive the love of the truth. They're going to be receiving the mark of the beast. We're talking about people left behind when the rapture happened. Who's left behind? Anybody that's not saved. And if they had a chance to be saved now, they, they heard the knowledge. <clears throat> they know what the truth is, but they didn't act on it. I, one of my favorite preachers is Dr. Adrian Rogers. He went on to be with the Lord in 2005. I love his preaching. And I like to listen to him on the Bible Broadcasting Network at 930 in the morning every day, every weekday great messages. And I heard a couple of his messages this week were just powerful. But he was talking about one of the greatest sins was the sin of procrastination. Anybody else hear that message? The sin of procrastination. He says more people have been damned to hell because of procrastination than any other sin. And he was just talking about that man Felix who Paul talked to and how he said some more convenient time. He had got to hear Paul preach about it for two years. Some more convenient time. Wow. He trembled. He trembled at the message. But that doesn't save. You have to receive it. You have to accept it. Wow. But notice this vengeance. As we're going to look at this is a warning. He goes on. He says, for we know him that he hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me. I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. No one is going to escape. No Christian can escape the judgment seat of Christ, which is a good thing. It's better to be at that than a great white throne judgment. Satan's here today in the form of a wasp. He's trying to scare us. He's up there high. Don't worry about him. We'll try to get rid of him later. But try not to let that respect take you away from what this is saying. Here, God's judgment of vengeance is coming on those who reject Jesus, on those who say, ah, that's not for me, on those who trod under the grace of God and the Son of God. Whew. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Well, let's end on a good note, though. 32 says, but call to remembrance. I, I want you to listen to several things. There's about six things in these verses uh, that I want to point out. First of all, there's this call. Call to remembrance the former days in which after you were illuminated, you endured a great flight of afflictions. A great fight of afflictions. Oh, um, our memory is a good thing. And sometimes our memory 
uh, it should be brought back into play where we remember all the good things and the bad things that happened that God saw us through after we got saved. A fight of afflictions. I believe Christians in America are starting to find out it's not going to be any different for us than it is for Christians in uh, China or Afghanistan or India or Iraq or Russia or Ukraine. It's not going to be any different for us than there as time goes on. We're hated because we stand on the truth. We're hated because we call sin, sin. We call a spade, a spade. And let me tell you, this transgenderism is nothing but confusion and wickedness. LGBTQ is the alphabet of perversion. Amen. And we should not back away from it, Amen. ever. But here he says, call to remembrance. Partly whilst you were made a gazing stock, both by reproaches and afflictions, and partly while you became companions of them that were so used. You start seeing that. First of that call, companions. You start identifying. You know, birds of a feather flock together is the old saying. But you start identifying with people of like faith who have had been through the same things. And, and, and as you uh, pray for each other and as you commiserate about what you've been through and you start thinking like Peter and James or Peter and, and John who said, Thank you, Lord, for counting us worthy to suffer for your name. And they didn't. They said, we ought to obey God rather than men. <clears throat> they actually prayed and thanked God for allowing them, finding them worthy to be counted worthy to suffer. Folks, suffering is a part of the Christian life. Let's not shy away from it. We've got to stay, stand true. And then he's not only the companion idea, he goes on, he said, um, for he had compassion of me in my bonds. <clears throat> oh, that sounds like the language of Paul. <laughs> he had compassion on me in my bonds. That's just one reason I think Paul might have written this book. Just one. This is that compassion. Some have compassion making a, a difference, Jude wrote in verse 22. He says, and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourselves that you have in heaven a better and an enduring substance. And think about spoiling of your goods. You think about our country. Those men, how many of them was it that wrote on that Declaration of Independence, that wrote on that document? Most of them lost everything. You talk about the spoiling of their goods. Most of them were rich individuals who lost. Many of them lost their homes. Many of them were sought out and were hunted down by the British. It didn't, it wasn't a one-time thing. All of a sudden, July the 4th, 1776, and everybody, no, it was a battle and a struggle that went on. And some of those men lost everything. The spoiling of their goods for our freedom and for our country, that's a great thing. But these people were willing to lose everything to identify with this man. If it was Paul, if it was Apollos, if it was Luke, whoever it was, they could identify with him because they had compassion upon him because they had Christ. My last point, we'll, you, we'll sum it up in a little bit, but I'm talking about this, this group. They're called to remembrance. They're told to have compassion. They're being told to be companions of those that are like treated. Compassion. <clears throat> I like what it says here further down. It says, if I could find my place, please forgive me. Verse 35, cast not away therefore your confidence. That's another C, your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. Did we not see the word boldness? Did we not, are we not uh, implored to come boldly to the throne of grace? He says, cast not away your confidence. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. You can have confidence when you face the enemy. You, you too sang about it this morning. How David, he didn't have a sword. He just had a sling and five smooth stones. He didn't wait for that giant to come to him. He ran to him. The Bible says he ran to that giant. Right in his forehead, that rock went. Wow, I'd love to have seen that. Watch that old giant fall flat right on his face. 
David went up, took his sword, cut his head off. Wow. There's confidence there that nobody else in Israel's army had. There's a great recompense of reward for that confidence. For you have need of patience that after ye have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. And that's, you know, confidence and patience and uh, growing in the Lord. It helps us all along in this whole matter. And the coming of the Lord is mentioned. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. We just have to wait. We can't control the date. We can't force it. We pray, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. But we occupy till he comes. We wait upon the Lord. He that will come, he that shall come, will come, and will not tarry. While the world is after, yeah, where's the Lord coming back? Where's the promise of his coming? Hey, you Christians are stupid. Oh, you're pie in the sky. They're all out there yakking. They're, they're bunch of, like a bunch of chickens. But we have the word of God reinforcing our confidence that he said what he said, and we can trust him about it. Amen. He will come again. He said so. But I want you to see something interesting. Oh, man, what a great passage. He says, now the just shall live by faith. Here's the other reason I think Paul wrote this. Because you see, Paul was a scholar of the Old Testament. And that was good for him as Saul. But when he got saved, then it all made sense. When he got saved, then he, at sitting at Jesus' feet for three years, then he saw that everything in the Old Testament was about Christ. Everything in the Old Testament pointed to Christ. And when Paul, yeah, that's why I believe I can't prove it, but when Paul used Habakkuk 2.4. Well, in fact, let's go over there a minute because it's an interesting passage. It's an important passage. It's quoted three times in the New Testament. Zechariah, Habakkuk. I don't know where it is. It's back there. <laughs> Habakkuk 2.4. Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by faith. This is a contrast between, and the context is the Babylonians, the Chaldeans, Nebuchadnezzar, whoever God's going to use is going to come in pride, prancing on their horses and destroying Jerusalem. And yeah, it's true. God is saying, whoever is built up and proud of themselves, they, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him. But the just shall live by his faith. And that has been a true statement in every dispensation. Whether it be Adam and Eve and Abel, who was killed, or Seth later on. Or whether it be Noah in his day. Or whether it be Abraham in his day. Or whether it be Jacob in his day. Or whether it be David in his day. Or whether it be any of the prophets in their day. The just shall live by faith. And it's true today. Everyone that gets saved is saved by faith. The just shall live by faith. And here's the reason I think Paul wrote this book is because in his wonderful diatribe and polemic in Romans 1, 17, he says that. He says in 1, 16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. The, for the just shall live by faith. And then in Galatians 3, 8, 11, he says the same thing. I don't remember the exact wording. I can't quote that one. But he says, the just shall live by faith. And then in, ha in Hebrews 10, 38, he says, now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, remember, we're talking about people on the fence. We're talking about people that are considering this whole argument about the superiority of Christ over the Old Testament and all that they were raised in, their whole system of Judaism. If anybody draw back, verse 38 says, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. Not the writer, as far as the human writer, but the Holy Spirit. God. God will have no pleasure in anyone that draws back. 
But we are not of them who draw back unto, look at that word, perdition. Apalia. A word which means destruction. There were only two people called the sons of perdition in the Bible. One is Judas. The other is the Antichrist. They're called sons of perdition. That means they are devoted to destruction. Perdition also has to do with hell, fires. It's funny how Hollywood likes to use words like that. They'll have movies of this perdition or this and that. And the, the reality is people that draw back, people who come to this knowledge of the truth, who will not take that step of faith and draw back, are doomed and they have nothing to look for but the fearful looking for of judgment and the wrath of God upon them forever but I said that we have some good news look at the last part but of them that believe he says we are not of them who draw back unto the perdition but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Why do we talk about being saved so much? Because of verses like this. To the saving of the soul. We are not of perdition. If you're saved, you are a believer, and you are a believer because you know God is going to save you to the uttermost. A great word that comes from the Bible. He's able to save them to the uttermost. To come unto God by him to the saving of the soul. So I, my last point was this. The live by faith group is the believer. I said the law's inability, the Lord's finality, the living way, the Lord's vengeance and judgment, but finally, the live by faith group. That is the believer. That's every one of us who are saved. We live by faith. We walk by faith, not by sight. We read the Bible. We believe it. We hear about Jesus from the Bible, not from Josephus, not from the Encyclopedia Britannica, not from some, uh, you know, Code of Hammurabi. It won't, it won't find him there. You'll find Jesus in the Bible. Amen. And if you have faith that has been departed to you, of his own will begat he us with the word of truth. He saved us and made us part of his family with the word of truth. We are now in the just shall live by faith group living by faith if you're not we invite you to join us we invite you to join us father thank you for your precious word it's magnificent it's miraculous it is truly totally separate from the rest of all that we can look at in libraries or uh, in our own libraries. Or, it is a special book, a book that is alive, sharper than a two-edged sword. I pray that you will use it in ways that I cannot in this invitation now. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand. Let's turn to 489. Let's sing the invitation.